Good morning, everybody. As you know, um, and you've heard from Hannah many times, she has had this innate feeling, a yearning, to not just want to do what we all should do, which is remember those who survived the Holocaust, learn from our past, teach it to the next generation. But she was fascinated when she found, by reading people's books, that so many of them were people who had either somebody else write it for them or wrote it themselves, but weren't in position to either want to live anymore, weren't in position to share their story. But when she realized how many were still, thankfully, alive and able to share, so she started reading some of those books and then she started interviewing them. And as you've seen over the course of the last two years, it's a very different concept. Nobody's really done this, just to interview the authors because you get to read the book, know the person, but you don't really get to have a chance to ask the questions that you can't ask a book. You know, the specifics about a certain story or certain things that were skipped in the story or some emotions that weren't conveyed. And so she went on this, um, this mission, her own life mission, just to find as many survivors as she could, read their stories. Sometimes she's read some of their books three or four times the same story to really understand it, get a grasp of it. And she's gone and she's interviewed them. So every moment, every day, every minute is precious and every story is precious. This specific story with Dita, who I haven't read the book, but I have heard from Hannah every night, she, she says a little portion with me, um, has been one that's really fascinated her because of, you know, because, of, because of the story itself and how it's conveyed and also the fact that she was known as the librarian in Auschwitz. And she's a very subdued, quiet lady. Hannah is, as you know, very calm, very sweet, but also very determined. So if she wants to do something, as long as the people are physically, mentally able to, she's going to encourage them to the extent that she can to get it done. And she's done it, and almost everybody has not only agreed to it, but actually enjoyed it and thanked her. And she's forged friendships. Now when she goes to Israel, she goes to visit them. Our children go to visit. We become like Mishpacha. So with Dita, Hannah had it all set up that during the, the heat of COVID, she was going to do a Zoom interview, and then suddenly, unfortunately, Dita got sick and got sick with COVID, was very, very sick, to a point that she never thought she would have the ability to have the strength. Should she survive, which thankfully she did, the strength to be able to share her story. And Hannah kept checking on, on her, I'm talking about for the better part of a year, every week or two, how are you, what's doing, got to know her like personal friends. And then Hannah said when she came, when Nina was, when Itai was born, so Hannah tried to go, she says, I'm just not well enough. I, I survived COVID, but the respiratory issues and the after effects, just because somebody survives COVID, doesn't mean it doesn't take a toll on the body. So bottom line is, Hannah said, don't worry, I'm not going to give up, I'll be back. And when she came back, Hannah called her every single day, had little chats. And just as of three days ago, she says, I would love to do it. I just don't have the strength to speak for an hour. So Hannah said, okay, if you can't, then I'll just interview you on Zoom when I come back but I want to see you. I want to hold your hand. I want to sit with you. It's such a difference in doing it on Zoom than it is coming to your apartment. Hannah doesn't like to drive, certainly not long distance, but when I rented a car, she said, leave the car with me. I was there for five days. She stayed for a couple more weeks with the children. She's coming back right after Tisha Bob on Monday. She says, I'm going to drive and I'm going to go to Dita. So she gets in the car, but of course you can imagine in Israel when it says an hour, it was more like an hour and 40 minutes because of traffic, it's the height of traffic. And Dita also gave a specific time that she could come. So when she sent out originally the email last night, 10 o'clock turned into 10.30, 10.40. But Hannah is there. There you go. Hello, everybody. I'm so sorry. We are trying to get this all to work. Where? But I want to thank everyone for joining us. And this is my husband, Rabbi Solomon. Hello, hello, Rabbi. Nice to meet you. How are you, Dita? Thank you so much for doing this. We yeah. appreciate it so much. Yes. Yeah. So I have waited, um, I think, a couple of years, more than a couple of years, to meet Dita. And I'm going to give a little bit of an intro um, to how I found out about Dita and why I was so determined to drive all the way here to Natanya for two hours in the car in the Israel traffic. Okay? So, Dita, you asked about me, so I'm gonna tell you a little <laughs> bit. Yeah. Uh, I was searching online for different books. I read a book called The uh, Tattooist of Auschwitz, which many of you have heard of. And next to that book on Amazon came another book called The Librarian of Auschwitz, which to me looked very interesting. And so I ordered it and I started to read it. And Dita's coming. 
When I read the book, which was written by author Antonio Interbe, in, how do you pronounce his name? Antonio Interbe. Um, I really didn't believe that his story could possibly be true. Even though this book is based on Dita's true story, um, it, you know, he does, it is historical fiction a little bit. He does add some things, but the, but the uh, outline, the basis of the story about there being a girl um, in living in Auschwitz amongst 500 other children, that part of it was very hard for me to believe because what, okay, I'll talk loud, Dita. I'll talk loud for you, okay? Doesn't work. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. No problem. No, problem with hearing and problem with Wi-Fi. Okay, yeah. <laughs> we'll make it work, right? So what were you saying? So I'm telling everyone when I read this book, uh -huh. your, the book about your story, I didn't believe that there were a lot of children living in a barrack. That was the first time that I actually heard that there were a few hundred children, not just living there, but being taken care of by other adult, well, teenagers, you being one of them. And, um, and I, I didn't, I thought it was all a made up story. And then I went online and I looked up your name and I saw that the story had truth to it. And I uh, looked up, I tried to find YouTubes or videos of you and I found some, but you were speaking only in Hebrew. Mm -hmm. The interviews were in Hebrew. So that was about more than two, more than COVID, like, uh, maybe three years ago or so, two and a half years ago. And so I said, well, Dita lives in Israel and she speaks Hebrew. And I don't know that uh, I would love to hear her speak, but I don't know that it's going to work uh, with a language barrier. But then Dita, your book, A Delayed Life, just came out in 2020. And this is a book that Dita wrote about her entire life, starting from before the war, um, living, you know, living the life that she lived in Europe, and then moving into um, Theresienstadt, which I'm going to ask Dita to tell us about. And from Theresienstadt, she was in Auschwitz and then uh, eventually moved here to Israel. And her whole story is told in that book. And once I saw that, I said, now I'm determined to find her because this is a fat book, which I wanted to bring here, but somebody borrowed. Um, I, I, it's a fat book all in English. So I found that I found videos of her speaking in English. And then I searched for Dita and I found DitaKraus.com. DitaKraus.com is a beautiful website, which I was planning to show you on the computer that has Dita's beautiful paintings because Dita paints flowers vases that she started learning how to paint in the camps in Theresienstadt. She had lessons there, art lessons. Right? It was not the first time, but oh, continuation. She, okay. <laughs> well, she's going to tell us more about it. And um, on that website, I saw a couple of videos, one of which I was planning to share, but it's a must. You must see Brundebar. So I'm going to talk about that soon. I'm going to ask Dita some questions. Actually going to open my notes because I had this is all your pictures I was going to show, Dita. And there's a video here that I may be able to open and show you from the phone. If I, I might be able to show you a few, a few minutes on the video if I put the phone the other way. So I'm going to ask Dita some questions and I'm going to have her do the talking. Okay. So Dita, um, you grew up in Prague. And if you can tell us a little bit about your life in Prague before to we were a Jewish family, but absolutely non-religious. My parents uh, didn't celebrate any Jewish uh, feast. Uh, I even didn't know that we were Jewish because it, it was never mentioned at home until uh, the time when uh, Hitler's armies occupied, uh, a, a short time before we, we knew, then I already knew. But uh, actually, what, what I began to feel that we are different was when uh, we were occupied uh, and uh, 
in the Nuremberg uh, laws against Jews started to uh, were in effect also in Czechoslovakia, which became Protectorat Böhmen und Mähren by Hitler. Uh, since then, we were restricted. I was an only child. My father was employed in the um, uh, pension, state pension institute as a lawyer, and uh, it was dismissed immediately with the entry of, the, of Hitler's armies. Uh, we had to clear our, our home. We were uh, we lived in a, in a rented flat in a nice uh, quarter of Prague the capital of Czechoslovakia, and uh, began all the harassments of Jews. We were stripped of everything. It slowly, 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 we had to hand over, hand over to the German, and the, the bank account was blocked, and, and, the, and the people were slowly uh, really stripped of everything until they became uh, non-persons. We were deported. We we were we had to uh, pack a, a suitcase. And couldn't take more than fifty kilograms of, uh, of uh, our belongings. Put on a train and sent to Terezin. Terezin is a small town uh, in the north of northwest of Czechoslovakia, Bohemia, the western part. Uh, it was meant as a military uh, town and surrounded by a huge wall, and that's why the Germans chose it as a as a ghetto. It was easily people could be easily uh, uh, watched, and, and they couldn't go in and out. It, the whole town is uh, surrounded by a huge, huge wall. Uh, we were separated, women and, and men were housed separately, and we children were uh, pre pre had preferred, preferred uh, the Jewish community was responsible for the, uh, for the ghetto, for the inner workings of the ghetto. The Germans only gave orders, but the Jews had to, to take care of everything. And uh, they... Uh, try to uh, give the children better conditions. Conditions were bad, but children had some better ones. How old were you, Dina? I was uh, 13 and a half when we arrived in the ghetto. Uh, we all had to work, everybody had to work. I saw my parents, I was also included in this girl, in one of the girls' homes, which was, um, a, a better building. We were 25, 26 girls in one room with uh, stacked uh, beds, uh, three three tired beds, with a with a house mother and the and the coach and the teacher. Secret. There was a secret uh, uh, tutoring. We we got uh, instruction schools, but secret. It was not. It's forbidden by the Germans. Children, Jewish children were not allowed to learn, not only children, nobody, uh, universities were forbidden, everything. From there, for after a year in the month from the ghetto, we were shipped to Auschwitz. Uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau, which Birkenau is a, is a part of, uh, of Auschwitz. And we were put into a special compound, which was called the family compound. Uh, the, it is not quite clear what the Germans intended, why they, why they treated the transport that arrived from Terezin differently than from the other Jews. Uh, in that compound, there were barracks separate for men and women, but in the same camp, we could meet outdoors, we could meet, men and women could meet. And there was a, one of the, there were hood, wooden, wooden huts. They uh, were uh, actually were, um, uh, horse, uh, horse uh, 
how do you call them? Uh, stable, like stables. They were, they were, the buildings were minted stables. There was no furniture or anything in them, only those three tile beds. Uh, but one of them was left empty and was allowed to, to be used as a daycare. And this is what Victor B. describes in his book, this daycare block number 31. Uh, where the children were uh, kept over uh, during the day. The girls slept in the house, in the homes with their mothers and the boys with their fathers. But during the day we were assembled there, uh, children till 14, 10 to 14, the younger ones uh, not, were not included. And uh, there were uh, madrichim, there were young men and women who uh, Counselors taught like and, and uh, took care of groups by age. One of those uh, groups was led by a man called Otto Kraus. Mm -hmm. And uh, the leader of all the, the, the children's block was called Freddy Hirsch. And he was, a, I knew him also from Prague already, a young. Uh, athlete, a sport teacher, a wonderful man, a Zionist with uh, really uh, a charismatic person who achieved this privilege for the children to be kept in this children's home uh, from the from the German from the la uh, Lager Commandant. He achieved that, and he was also the the leader of the, of the home. Uh, you know, he funny. looked for uh, workers among, uh, he also got permission from the Germans to employ kids between 14 and 16. And I was the 15 at the time, almost. And uh, I got mm -hmm. a, a job to take care of the few books that were on the children's block. Uh, this didn't last very long. We were there six months. Uh, towards the end of those of those six months, we were supposed to be uh, exterminated in the gas chambers in June. We arrived in December, we got six months life, and then it said SB, which means in the in the uh, uh, archives there, it said uh, SB Sonderbehandlung, which is another word for gas chamber just in the gas chamber. We knew that. We knew that our life should end in June. In, in May came new orders from Germany. And uh, Dr. Mengele, who was the doctor on the local Krankenbau, the block for the sick, got the order to choose people who were able, able to work. We were not so decimated yet, uh, able to work. Uh, my, my, my father didn't last long. When we arrived in December, he uh, became uh, very weak and very thin and we were, the hunger was extreme. And my father died in, at the beginning of, of February. He just uh, wasted away until he didn't wake up. Uh, my mother and I were chosen from uh, among the selection and sent to Germany to work with uh, from the more than 10,000 people who were at the highest time at the time where the most people were in the in the family camp uh, only about 1,500 men and 1,500 women were chosen to work. Those that rem remained behind were uh, exterminated in the gas chambers in July 1944. We came to Germany. We worked very hard. Men's, men's work. We were with shovels and pickaxes. And, uh, and there were Food was 
cars and, and it, it was cold and we had no clothes and we worked outdoors and it was very hard. And at night we didn't sleep because there was air raids and we had to go into the cellar and uh, barely uh, came back and fell asleep and there was another alarm and we again had to go. And then it was morning and we had to go to work. So we didn't eat enough, deep enough. And we were there until March 1945, towards the end of the war. Uh, the Germans started uh, shipping all those people who were scattered in smaller work camps into the um, bigger uh, concentration camps. Mostly, mostly uh, they walked on foot, the so-called hunger marshes. Uh, but we were shipped by train and arrived in Bergen-Belsen, which was the worst of the worst camps. Uh, a few days later, after we arrived, the English, uh, the British Army uh, um, liberated the camp. But there was a current time we couldn't leave. We were not allowed to leave. There was typhus, and uh, uh, we stayed another two months. By the end of that time, we had. By the, by the end of June, we were supposed to be allowed, after the, the epidemic was abating, so we were gradually being shipped away from there. But my mother suddenly became ill, and within two days she died. Although she had been recovered in those two months, she had gained weight and she was already working even for the British Army in an office there. So I remained alone. And uh, by the next uh, bus uh, coach that went from the pen, uh, uh, ferry, ferry people from, uh, from the camps to the various countries, by the next bus I was put in the next bus to go to Prague which was the next day after my mother died. So I came home, with me, my home, there was no home. I came to Prague and uh, started <laughs> to rebuild my life. Uh, as to the book by Iturbe, he tried to um, in, include uh, a a lot of information that did not really uh, concern uh, the main story. Uh, all, all of those uh, were uh, um, things that, he, that were historically correct, but he, he also has uh, various, uh, um, I couldn't say mistakes, but misconceptions about a place which he didn't know, which only uh, imagined. So uh, some of the details are not uh, not uh, as they as they are described in the book. So I'm going to show another book. This is another book that I read that I suggest you read: The Children's Block by Otto Kraus. Otto Kraus was Dita's wonderful husband, who wrote um, a few books. Yes. One was the painted wall. Is this the painted wall? Is this it the is, same it is the painted wall with a new, new title. And this is based on truth, even though the names it are was, changed? It's uh, translated. Okay, so this book talks about the actual uh, way that the children lived and learned inside of that barrack that you were in. This is exactly how it was. He's, he made it into a novel also to make it readable. He didn't want to write a document, but a novel. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, all that he wrote is uh, based on, on historical fact. I can show you the original painted board. I would like to see Yes, it. I bring you. Oh, okay. Thank you. So I have I a question. To... I'm sorry, I have a question. I have, yes. I can share the screen for uh, the website. 
I, I found it. Would that yes. be helpful? Okay. Zeta Cro I have it. Yeah. I have, um, I, I have the website you, here. You, it's pop. Okay. Yeah, that is the website. Um, Any videos there? There is a video on there. Wait, first, uh, this is the painted wall by Otto Kraus. Is this still for sale? Or? This is how it first came out in English. It was okay. first printed in Czech in 1947. Wow. And in English, it came out here in Israel. I don't remember the, the year. Okay. Um, so can you tell us about your uh, connection to Otto in the camp and then how you met him after? Did, I know that um, what, you know, what relationship did you both have in, in the, the camp? relationship was non-existent. Otto was in Madrid. He had a, a group of children of 12 year old boys, about 15 or 20 boys, set in a circle around him. And uh, he was there with their coach, their teacher, their madrid. Uh, they learned something, or everything was only oral. There, there were no utensils, there were no pencils, no pens, no paper, no books, except for a few books to, to read. So everything was spoken. He would tell them stories, he would teach them, he would uh, play with them, they would sing. They spent the day together. Each group had a, a madrich or a madricha. And what did you do? And yeah. I was sitting nearby in the same play, in the same corner of, the, of that uh, children's block. And I could watch him. I, I had my, the books there. I didn't know. I wasn't busy all the time, so I could watch him. <laughs> but he was with the back to me, so he never <laughs> noticed me. He hardly noticed me. But when we met after the war, we met, so I could. Uh, he recognized me and uh, we started talking. Can I take yes, a yes. So, um, would you like me to share a video on there or anything? Um, there's a, a video, um, a 60 minutes video on Brunderbar, it's called. Um, I'm not sure. I can, I can share it from. I'll share the link with everyone. Yeah, see the one on the bottom right. That's the one I was going to show, but I'm not showing the whole thing. It's very long. I was going to cut and see if you, if you can share it okay, I'm for a minute. Share it now. This sure. is the video of Brundabar. This this is going to tell a little bit of this of um, actually Dida's in this video a few different places. Much of the world in the um, dark. Part of the answer is in our story tonight. It concerns a concentration camp called. I can hear it, but I can't see it. In Czechoslovakia. And near the end of the world. One more time. I'll, I can share it from my computer, but let, and I'm let's gonna have do it right now. Data tell us a little. Okay, go ahead. Okay. Okay. So um, that was on your website, the, the Brundabar story. Um, you want to tell us a little bit about your life? And we'll go a little bit back to the life in Theresienstadt, and then we'll talk a little bit. I'll ask a little bit more. I just wanted to know in Theresienstadt, the it, this was a village that the Nazis try to portray that they were treating the Jews really nicely. That's what you'll see in the video. And so they had art classes and theater. So um, do you want to tell us a little bit about what you did when you yeah. were there? <laughs> it is included uh, all the Jews from not only Czechoslovakia, oh, Slovakia not, but Czechia and Moravia, Germany, Austria, and so on. Among them, a lot of uh, scientists and professors and, and actors and, and regisseurs and uh, uh, artists of all kinds. And they, after they worked, they produced also plays or they lectured. They came into the children's home also to lecture us children about uh, some subject. Uh, there was a really, really, uh, Cultural life one wouldn't believe until the, in those conditions, with the hunger, the the crowds, the vermin, with the cold in in winter, with the heat in summer, with those terrible conditions, still people were eager <coughs> to hear a lecture Sorry. and to hear uh, some music and to perform. 
You are an art teacher. And one of the performances was uh, uh, the children's opera Brundiva that had been uh, composed by a Jewish uh, composer Hans Krasa. Uh, a small, a short, a short opera about children and acted and sang by, by children. Uh, when I arrived, they already were rehearsing that and the rehearsals took place in the girls' home in the cellar. Uh, I was allowed to join them and I became part of the choir. And after some time, we started performing. There was no hall, so of course, but one of the bigger rooms in one of the barracks, barracks were two-story, huge, two-story buildings for the soldiers. There were large uh, halls for, for uh, uh, housing the, the soldiers. So in one of those rooms, they made a kind of uh, stage and we performed the Brundiva there and people were allowed, they got tickets from the so-called uh, culture department of the Jews, Jewish uh, leadership. So people could uh, acquire a ticket and uh, we performed every few days. There were in all 50, more than 50 performances of which I was uh, part in 25 of them. And then I was already sent to Auschwitz, but they continued. The, uh, Germans did not uh, show, uh, keep the ghetto as a show place all the time. That was only for a few days for a certain uh, uh, purpose. The purpose was a visit by the uh, commission of the Swedish Red Cross. And for that, they prepared months in, in, in advance, they prepared the ghetto to show them. And they coached the children to, to say things, as if they were friendly with the SS people. And it was all staged to the last, to the last letter. Everything was made beautiful for the route that they would take that, that commissioned these people. And these people were satisfied with what they saw and gave a very good report about ghetto. But this was only for a very short time. And not of it, not of all the time, right? But it was to make them to uh, to trick them to make them think that they were treating that all the ghettos were like this. They sh they took them in for a short time, but they didn't want them. They did this in order to make them not, you know, not be on top of them and not bother them to make them think that they're treating all the ghettos are like this, and this is how they treat the people in the ghetto. It, it was it was like. <laughs> All, all, not, not, uh, not. Uh, it was a show. It was a yes. show. Yeah. The, the, the... But I wasn't there when they came. I was already Auschwitz. I didn't know about it. We ended after the war. We heard about it. Wow. So a lot of the people in Theresienstadt were being um, shipped to Aus Auschwitz, including a lot of the kids that were most in, of most them. Of in, them. In, in fact, Theresienstadt was only a. a, a a, 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 a temporary camp from there, most of the people who came to Theresien to, to for their, to their death to other camps, yes. most of them to Auschwitz, but also to Treblinka and Majdanek and other camps. Okay, um, so let me ask you a couple of questions about the books. Can you, the books that you were in charge of when you were 14 years old, there was a danger in having the books, in being caught with the books. So if you can tell us what the books were and how you kept I don't remember the titles. Okay. I, when I came back, I knew them all because there were no more than 13 books. Not as, uh, it would make it smaller even. Uh, there must have been 12 or 14 books, not more. Mm -hmm. Because I remember the, the size of the, I had a little board in front of me Okay. like this and there they stood and I have a, I have a drawing it's somewhere also 
in the you in, picture somewhere here. Oh, a maybe drawing. in your in the drawing of the of the of the inside of the children's block. Mm. There's a stick figures, as, and the the books as wow. Mm. And uh, so, how did you keep? But up? the, the uh, I remember there was uh, these books were were collected by the people who sorted the luggage. Yes. Not Canada. not our people. The the mm -hmm. most the the older uh, prisoners. Uh, <laughs> the, 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 <laughs> were there longer. They, their job was to sort the uh, cell luggage that remained after the people were shipped to the... Uh, the, the mm -hmm. Descended from the train, we, we, we watched them. Every day came trains. Our camp boarded the, the, the tracks. We could look uh, at the, uh, the tracks. The people descended from the train and started walking and the luggage remained on the ramp. And prisoners sorted, opened, made mountains of food, mountains of clothes, of shoes, of uh, whatever. And he and they, they found a book. Not, not uh, the books were not only in Czech. They were some of a German. One was a Russian grammar. They were not books to read, but the, the Madrichim used them as best they could. Make, making games out of letters and things like that. Uh, some of them they could read. I don't remember which, but uh, they were other other books than men, than Turba mentions there. They, Different ones. There was not the Schweik book. There was not the the others that he mentions. Oh, no, he makes that. The uh, Magic Mountain wasn't there. I know. <laughs> okay. Well. Um, what was the situation with uh, if if you were caught if it, if the, the children were caught holding books? The children didn't read the books. The children the teacher. didn't get the books. Only the madrichim. And they knew to hide if the. As, if there, the I don't remember uh, um, occasions of control, like they are described by Turpin. Mm. I don't remember such occasions. Mm -hmm. So I, I also don't remember that uh, we, was, we were hiding, hiding them. Mm -hmm. I have no such uh, recollection. Mm -hmm. um, I think that the author, when he read about you having the books, what inspired him was that he was writing about different libraries and he wrote about the smallest library that existed and yeah. the librarian who kept that library. So that inspired yeah. him to read. This. When I met uh, Iturbe, when we first met in Prague, after we uh, being uh, corresponded by a mail, uh, I took him to, to Theresien, to Theresienstadt. And uh, when we, for a day and the next day, uh, we were both in Prague, I wanted to see where I lived and where I grew up, where I went to school. And then when, before we parted, he, he said to me, I think I'm going to write a book about this because you were the librarian of the smallest library in the world. Everybody knows about the greatest, but nobody knows about the smallest. Yes. I like the idea. He loved it. I didn't, I didn't, trust him. I didn't uh, take it seriously when he said he would write about it. But two years later, he had a book. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's how I found out about you. And then you had your own book, which mm -hmm. also gave a lot of detail. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us you have paintings in the that you painted in Theresienstadt that are in the museum in Prague today? Well, uh, they are kept all the, all the children's doing that we had to uh, we had the drawing lessons with Frida Brandeis, who was an artist and a pedagogue and a wonderful woman. I was one of her students. We were volunt she, she would come and say, who wants to, to go with me and uh, have a lesson? And who wanted came. I always wanted, so I was present at most of her lessons. And many of the children, she kept all the, the all the drawings. She even wrote dates or names when when they, they were missing, and kept it in a in a suitcase. And she was sent to Auschwitz like everybody else. And the suitcase was found after the war in the ghetto and brought to the museum in the Jewish museum in Prague. 
and they were slowly, slowly sorting them. And 12 or 14 of my drawings exist there. And one of them is displayed in Prague in, the, in one of the Jewish places. I it's hope to see it. One of the synagogues. I hope to see it one day. It, in the synagogue or in the museum? It's in the so called Pinkas synagogue. Pinkas synagogue. There oh, is a, on the top floor, it's a narrow building with very narrow store, store, uh, staircase. And on the top floor is one room, not larger than this one. And on the walls around are the drawings of the little children. Wow. Wow. What can you tell us about the painted wall in the children's barrack? I know Otto writes about it, that there was a painted wall. In the introduction to here, you wrote that most of Otto, Otto's work was based on truth. The only difference is the painted wall was made by one person and he says it's made by two. Do you ah, remember yes. the paint, there was a wall? No, was... the difference between uh, what it would be, right? Yeah. Ah, no, 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 no. I know what you mean. Uh, yes, he, um, he wrote about Lisa Pomnenka, who is the artist, <laughs> but he combined two women. Yes. In fact, there were two women, I know them both, especially one was a good friend. Uh, um, uh, her name was, um, uh, <laughs> we all called her Mousy, uh, Marianne Herman, and the other was uh, Dina Gottlieb, later Babbitt, the baby was married Babbitt, and she uh, survived, both survived. Marianne lived in Scotland and uh, Dina lived in the United States. And they both painted on the wall and nobody is exact. Nobody remembers exactly what they painted, but I know there were the Snow White and the Seven Wolves of Disney. That is agreed by everyone. And there were uh, Eskimos and Igloos that I remember, and other people. And Dina, Dina herself wrote to Otto, to my husband, when he uh, asked her that she made a picture of a view, like th seeing through a window, a Swiss landscape. This I don't remember. Wow, so this was actually in the barracks, in the children's barracks. Was this in the place where they were learning in Auschwitz? Yes, that was in the children's block. In the children's block. They had people that painted on the wall. And, and Mengele supplied the paints. Mengele hired one of the painters, right? That's what Otto said in his book. One of the artists Mengele hired to draw some of his patients. That's what Otto said, I'm not sure. That was uh, Dina. He gave her paints because he wanted uh, her to make portraits of the, of the, in the gypsy camp of, uh, of uh, gypsies, of people in, because he, he said um, photos are not good enough. He, um, he wants it in color. Yeah. Um, another question. In Otto's book, he talks about a secret plan. They were collecting um, explosives. Mm -hmm. the, the Jews. Ben benzene. Uh, to, to make uh, uh, a fire. Fuel, fuel to fuel. make a fire. So what was the, what do you know about that plan? I read about it only after the war. I had no idea about it. Okay. Um, Did Otto the, know? What, what he describes that he, he knew he was in, in not part of the uh, um, underground, but he knew someone who uh, this was and he knew about it. He knew there was a, they prepared to, uh, uh, to cause a, 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 a fire and, uh, and try to escape to the gates. That was in March, in March of 1944. It didn't take place, the uprising didn't take place. Right. Did that have something to do with Freddie Hirsch? Freddie Hirsch was supposed to be a part of that. He was gonna blow the whistle, that's what Otto said. Ah, that was Freddie. Freddie, yes. 
uh, how, how to give the, the, the uh, signal signal for to start the uprising. It was pretty was a pretty uh, task because he, as a sport teacher, had a hanging on around his leg. He, he had a, a whistle, which he often used when, when he uh, <laughs> uh, made uh, whatever um, with the children when he was. Uh, doing exercises with them, yes. but she did outdoors often. So um, I, I think what we're going to do now is I'm going to show a couple of pictures using my phone and you'll tell everyone here will let me know if they can see it. Um, I'll also show a little bit of Rundabar, the video. Mm -hmm. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. So. I'm going to do that now. Uh, that performance yes. was also only the performance that you can that you will show was mm -hmm. also part of the pooling of the of the uh, uh, the, the Swiss uh, committee. They dressed the children up. We had no we had no uh, uh, real stage or real. Uh, as I told you, we, mm -hmm. the performance was in on the on the in the attic of the of one of the barracks. But for for the Germans, they uh, um, uh, took the, the the local hall, the local cinema cinema hall, and made it into a, a show for the Germans. Yeah, I actually downloaded, so I'll be able to show it to you. Um, first, I'm going to show you a few pictures. I'm going to talk over them. Um, hopefully, I could turn my yeah. Okay, I'm going to. Just share. This is a picture of the author of the book. Um, and this is the book. This is A Delayed Life. This is the book that came out in 2020 and has a full true story of Dita's life and really a great read. This is Dita when she's younger. You want to tell us who this is? Mm -hmm. That's this Dita. is when I, we started dating. Yeah, this is Dita and Otto when they started dating. I started with my parents. Mm -hmm. That's Dita with her mother and father. Okay. Um, my best friend, well, Raya. Her best friend, Raya. And where was this picture taken? Raya died this last December. Oh. Wow. Is this in Prague before? This is in Prague? Yes, it's in Prague. This is in Prague. Just before the, this, I'm, I'm a, it's a baby. That's Dita <laughs> as a baby. a pet baby. <laughs> it's adorable. There's another friend of mine. Also. That's Otto. That's Otto with his book. That's his book. Okay, I think that's it for this one. Um, but I'm going to show you something else. Ready. Yes. Yes. When you Would read you like to Otto's book, yeah, I'm going to show the video right in one second. But when you read Otto's book, and when you read, uh, and when you read Dita's book, you will get to know Freddie, who's a real hero. Before the war, he had lots of children's um, athletic programs and groups for them, and he had a way with the Germans to be able to get a lot of things. Um, for the children. Can you hear me? Can everybody hear and see? Yes. Okay. So here's Otto. This is before the war, right? No, this is already during the occupation on the, on the playground called Hagibor. Okay. In Prague. Okay. And the man in front is a, a, a magician performing in front of the Jewish children. And the man who is holding the rope is ready. But you should show also the the boy on the left of the picture. You don't have it. Oh, I know which. It's, it's ah, in the book. It's but, in the book. Uh, that this is a private photo. Is, the photo is a private one, but on the left of the of the magician. Yes. The uh, stands. He. This is cut off. Yeah, I, I don't. In the know. original, there is uh, Harris uh, Otto's brother. Yes, he yes. He was the assistant of in the, the book, magician. In your book, I saw that picture online. I didn't see that picture. I was looking for that picture online. Yeah. Okay. And this is what uh, in, in Harris' album we found this, this yeah. picture. He collected his pictures and 
it, uh, had hit the, the album in, in, with, with somebody and also cut it back after the war. Wow. How it didn't survive. Wow. Okay. I'm going to start with the video. How did the Nazis manage to kill six million Jews and keep so much of the world in the dark? Part of the answer is in our story tonight. It concerns a concentration camp called Theresienstadt. It was in Czechoslovakia, and near the end of the war, the Nazis used it to con the world. Reports had begun circulating in Allied capitals that the Nazis were exterminating Jews. The Nazis wanted to refute those reports, so they took this one camp, Theresienstadt, and turned it, if ever so briefly, into a model town. They shot a movie there to prove how good they were to the Jews, and they invited the Red Cross to inspect it. Central to the deception was the performance of a children's opera called Brunderbar. The opera survived the war, and so did a few members of its cast. They're in their mid-70s now, and a few months ago, they invited us to spend some time with them. Every summer, a remarkable reunion takes place in these lush mountains in the Czech Republic. A group of friends come together from all over the world. They have one thing in common. They all grew up in the shadow of death in a concentration camp outside of Prague. They grew up quickly. Helga Kinski couldn't speak about the horror for a full 40 years. Because actually, whatever you did, you didn't have the right to live. You were, you were sentenced to death. And that is something you can't get over. Their friendship began here in Theresienstadt, a transit camp. From here, a garrison town before the war, Jews were sent off to the gas chambers of Auschwitz. Nearly 140,000 Jews from all over Central Europe passed through here, including many of Europe's most prominent artists, who left a record of what it was like. Much of the art has survived, some of it by children. They portrayed how cold and crowded they were, sleeping 30 to a room. Typhus epidemics swept through the camp. The dead were brought to catacombs before being incinerated. Bodies were carried on the same wagons used for bread. Jews weren't gassed here, but more than 30,000 died of disease and hunger. Music flourished in the camp. It was like a Juilliard for Jews. There were classes and concerts in cellars and attics. The hottest ticket in town was a children's opera called Brunderbar, which was written by a Czech Jew and smuggled into the camp. It wasn't easy to get tickets. Dita Krauss was in the choir in Brunderbar. Tickets were printed for Brunderbar? Tickets were printed for every performance. And Brunderbar was a difficult ticket to get? Yeah, most, I think. Maybe the most difficult. It was performed 55 times by children in Theresienstadt. Oh, winter wind came blowing, goosey flew up high. It's a fairy tale of sorts, the story of a young brother and sister who, with the help of a cat, a dog, a bird, and the children of the village defeat an evil organ grinder named Brunderbar. The opera ends with a victory song. Back in the camp, the Nazis filmed this performance in 1944. The lead role, the part of Brunderbar, was played by a boy named Hansa Treiklinger. He's the kid with the mustache. Everybody loved him and everybody adored him. Back then, Ella Weisberger played the cat. I wore my sister's ski pants and my mother's sweater, black sweater. This was my costume. Wearing a costume was a relief from what Ella and the other kids had to wear all the time in the camp. This was the only time that they said we don't have to put on the Jewish star. A little a couple minutes of freedom. A couple of minutes of freedom for Ella the cat. The whole town was mesmerized by the opera, the story of an evil man with a mustache. An evil man with a mustache? Did the kids have any idea what the opera was really about? Oh, yes, they knew exactly the, the symbolic meaning. I'm sure they did. The whole thing was, of course, uh, uh, symbolic, you know. Brunjiba was Hitler. So, uh, oh yes, they knew. Reports were circulating in Allied capitals that Jews were being deported and exterminated. 
The Nazis wanted to refute those reports. They decided on an audacious deception to make Theresienstadt look like a model Jewish town, to invite in the International Red Cross for an inspection, and to make this propaganda film showing what a nice place it was. A beautification plan was implemented immediately. They painted buildings, they planted flowers and opened stores, they put up a bandstand in the town square. Helga Kinski watched it all unfold. Uh, they built a kindergarten in a small park. They opened a coffee shop and they chose the people who sit there and listen to music and drink their coffee usually young, uh, pretty women. They made Terezin into a beautiful little place. And they made it a lot less crowded. Just before the Red Cross delegation arrived, the Nazis shipped 7,500 people off to Auschwitz, creating more open spaces. The stage was now set. On June 23, 1944, the Red Cross delegates came for their one-day visit, and the show began. The Nazis decided that a performance of Blunderbar would be the highlight. As the trains kept on heading to Auschwitz, the cast of Blunderbar kept on changing. Ella's co-star, Hansa Treitlinger, that young boy who played Blunderbar, was sent to the gas chambers in 1944. The opera's composer, Hans Krasse, was killed about the same time. For those who stayed here in Theresienstadt, it meant learning new parts all the time, but that wasn't a problem because everyone knew the opera by heart. But by the end of 44, performances stopped abruptly because there was hardly anyone left. Dieter Krauss was 14 when she was bundled onto a train to Auschwitz. For me, the Holocaust started after Theresien. Theresien was still acceptable compared to what was after. The day we left Theresien, the world changed totally, radically. Like very few other cast members of Blinderbar, Dieter survived Auschwitz and Bergen-Belsen. But she lost most of her family and many of her friends. So few of them survived. And they were so talented. And so many wonderful children among them, and promising children. Children that would have become poets and artists, and so many of them, they are all gone for nothing. The cast members of Brunderbar who did survive got together this autumn. They walked around to Resenstadt that old concentration camp, which is now a provincial town again. And Blinderbar, children from all over the world perform this opera these days, this fairy tale set to music. Tonight, children from a nearby Czech school put on a performance for members of the original cast. same to Resenstadt attic where they first performed it more than 60 years ago. The girls, as they still call themselves, remembered their lives. The school children invited them to join in the finale, the victory song. They stole the show. So on behalf of Hanu, who I, must, I assume lost data, I thank you all for joining us. I also want to give a special thank you to the Kirschenbaum family who have sponsored this entire uh, Kirschenbaum Holocaust Survivors Series, all the things that we're going to be doing for them in loving memory of their mishpacha, of their family, and she wished them long life and good health. And thank you all for